Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're going to let um, more people filter into the room and then we'll get started in about a minute. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. There are still people who are joining us remotely, but um, I'll just kind of get going and we'll, by that time, everybody will be um, ready to go. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Linda Mitchell, CEO for Allergy and Asthma Network. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Alice Hoyt as today's presenter. We have a few quick housekeeping items to do go through before we get started. First, all participants will be uh, participants will be on mute for this webinar. We will be recording this webinar and we will post it on our website in a couple of days. You can find all of our recorded webinars on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. If you just go to the homepage, scroll down to the bottom, we have all the webinars listed there, and then you can click on the link to the webinar that you might be interested in so you can view the notes and the recording. This webinar will be one hour in length, and that includes time for questions. We will take those questions at the end of the web webinar, or I might um, uh, stop Dr. Hoyt and ask any particular one that's relevant at the time. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in there. We have someone monitoring the chat if you have questions or need help technically, and we will get to as many questions as we can before we conclude today's webinar. This is an advanced webinar presented in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The college offers CMEs for this webinar. We also have a certificate of attendance if you need it for your records. A few days after the webinar, you will receive an email with supplemental information and a link to download the certificate of, or of attendance if you need it. We will also try to add the link to the certificate in the chat during today's webinar. So let's get started. Today's topic is one here to my heart. It's emergency planning for children with asthma and anaphylaxis. Between 1.6 and 5% of people in the United States have experienced at least one episode of anaphylaxis. The most common triggers are certain foods, medications, and insect stings. Many people with food allergies also have asthma. Since respiratory symptoms are common with both conditions, it can be challenging to know whether someone is experiencing a severe allergic reaction or an asthma flare because of the similar symptoms. Asthma, food allergy, and a high risk, asthma and food allergy combined put at, um, people at risk for a higher risk for anaphylaxis and they can occur together and asthma can increase the risk for fatal anaphylaxis. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Alice Hoyt. Dr. Hoyt is the chief allergist at the Hoyt Institute of Food Allergy in New Orleans, Louisiana. She is board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics and allergy and immunology. During her fellowship at the University of Virginia, Dr. Hoyt launched a now national allergy focused nonprofit organization, the Teal Schoolhouse, supporting the Code Anna program, which teaches medical and non medical school personnel and childcare providers about medical emergencies. So we've got the right person here to talking to us today, right? Um, at Vanderbilt University, Dr. Hoy continued her food allergy focused efforts before transitioning to the Cleveland Clinic, where she helped launch its Food Allergy Center of Excellence. Dr. Hoy decided to bring her food allergy knowledge to families in her home state of Louisiana and launched the Hoyt Institute of Food Allergy. In addition to leading the institute, Dr. Hoyt hosts the top ranked food allergy podcast, Food Allergy in Your Kiddo, and chairs Code Anna. So thank you for being here today, Dr. Hoyt. I'll let you go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Linda. I'm so excited to be here and honored that y'all asked me to present on this topic because I do think this is arguably um, one of, if not the most important topic that we can discuss when it comes to our kiddos who have food allergies, who have asthma, who have both. Um, and guys, 
you're out there, um, as you're listening to this, as you're, I want you to be as engaged as possible as we can be in a webinar. So definitely put your questions into the chat. And if we don't get to them in the middle of the talk, then we're gonna get to them afterwards because I want everybody's questions to be answered today. So thank you again to the Allergy and Asthma Network for hosting this super important presentation. And we're gonna dive on in and get started. So you guys know, if you're here, the mission of the Allergy and Asthma Network is to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and the related conditions through outreach, through education, advocacy, and research, through, through webinars just like this. And so when you have questions, definitely put the questions in the chat. Um, disclosures, no relevant disclosures. Okay, what are you going to walk away with if you sit there and pay attention and engage in this presentation today. You are gonna know how to do the following after this presentation. You will be able to list and describe the preparedness measures needed for a child with asthma. You're gonna be able to list and describe the preparedness measures needed for children who are at risk of anaphylaxis um, or have other severe food allergies. And you're going to be able to develop an emergency plan for children who have asthma and are at risk and or at risk of anaphylaxis. So that's a lot to put into this time period, but we have a lot of resources info in this talk. You're gonna love it. So let's start, type into the chat, please. What is your role in keeping kids safe? Are you a parent? Are you a healthcare professional? If you're a healthcare professional, what type of healthcare professional are you? And then also please put the name of your state. Um, I'll start, I am an allergist. I am also the parent of a little baby who has a food allergy. Um, I am the wife of a man who has a food allergy um, and I live in Louisiana. I'm looking at the chat and we've got school nurse in Connecticut, Virginia, ooh, lots of school nurses. All right, parents, respiratory therapists, Illinois, Washington, Texas. Oh my gosh, I love it, I love it, I love it. Um, keep that going, I'm, I'm so glad everybody is here, wow. Okay, so as you all know, um, in any, any presentation, you need to have a hook, right? You need to have a hook that gets, people's attention. Well, probably the, the worst thing to grab our attention is what we're all thinking here. The whole reason we're all here is we want to keep these kids safe. What do we want to keep them safe from? From having a life-threatening reaction, from having a severe asthma exacerbation. And so I wanted to put up here, um, this is from the National Food Allergy Death Registry, which sounds terrible, but is a very important thing to keep. It's led by Dr. Stacey Doris at Vandy. Um, an old friend of mine, she's lovely, and she does this, which is amazing. Um, this is what we are all concerned about, right? The other reason I put this map up here is because death from a food allergy is like a shark bite. It, it should never happen when a child goes to the beach, and if it happens, we hear about it, right? So I want this to be something that's grabbing your attention. This is what absolutely we are trying to prevent it is rare when it happens, but does it matter if it's rare when it happens, if it happens to your child? No, right? So by the end of this talk, you're going to know ways to prevent this from happening. And I think before we move on, I believe we have some questions. Um, Courtney, here we go. Here's our poll. Got to have some engagement when we're doing these webinars. Okay, so please answer the questions. How, how often um, do you worry that a child or that your child or a child in your care will have an allergic reaction or an asthma exacerbation and select one? The next question, how confident are you in your own ability to manage your child or a child in your care who is having an allergic reaction or an asthma exacerbation? And then the third question, and this was one of the reasons I wanted to hear who, who our audience is made up of, a lot of school nurses out there. Thinking of all your child's caregivers as a whole, how confident are you in other caregivers' abilities to manage if that child is having an allergic reaction or an asthma exacerbation? So if you're a school nurse, how confident are you that your non-medical 
um, colleagues, the teachers, the counselors are going to be able to manage that child. Um, if you're a parent, how confident are you that the school is going to be able to, to take care of your child? And go ahead and put your answers in there. I think we probably had enough time to, to have people uh, select their choice. So can we go ahead and close that? And are we able to show the answers? Here we go. Okay, so emergency planning webinar polls. Here we go. Number one, how often do you worry? It looks like sometimes 43% of you guys sometimes are worrying. 37% often are worrying. 12% are always worrying. Let's keep going. That second, that second question, how confident are you in your ability to manage? Well, most of you are very confident or fairly confident. Some of you are somewhat confident. And then it kind of flips. How confident are you in other people's ability to manage? Not at all confident. 52% of you are somewhat confident that someone else is going to be capable. So by the end of this talk, you're going to have resources that aren't just going to help you because based on this, a lot of you guys feel pretty good about your ability, but you're not feeling too good about other people's ability to keep those kids safe. So we're going to fix some of that at the end of this. Let's keep going. Here we go. Preparedness measures needed for children with asthma. So first, we're going to talk about asthma, you guys. So what really is um, asthma? It's a catch-all term. Uh, it really is a catch-all term. And it's for conditions that cause reversible airway obstruction. There's allergic asthma. There's neutrophilic asthma. There's all these different types of asthma. If for our little, there's viral induced wheezing. Is that asthma? And some kids, it's going to be asthma, right? And the symptoms really it includes coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and a lot of children have asthma. According to the CDC, 6.5 percent of children have asthma. I think that's a little bit on the low side, but still, that's a lot of kids have asthma. And asthma exacerbations are all too common. So looking at some of this data, um, the national prevalence of asthma attacks among children and adults with um, current asthma, this is from 2021. And looking specifically at this table, we have the characteristics, the age and, the, and um, less than 18, so kiddos or adults, and then the number of asthma attacks, and then the percent. So ultimately what this is showing us is that not only do a lot of kids have asthma, but they're having asthma exacerbations. And why is this important? An asthma exacerbation really indicates that a child's asthma is not well controlled and thus management needs to be stepped up. We need to improve our management. Um, I'm so glad that there's so many school nurses on this call because sometimes it's really our school nurses who are gatekeepers, they're the ones who are seeing that, oh, this kiddo has to keep coming in to use his albuterol. So clearly there's some sort of problem here if he's, he keeps having to use his albuterol, his asthma is not well controlled. Now, thank goodness that you are there to recognize that because in some cases where they're not school nurses, someone might think that it's normal for a kiddo to use their albuterol every day after recess because they're getting out of breath and wheezing. But because they're school nurses, you guys are recognizing, oh wait, this asthma management might need to step up. So how do you really treat an asthma exacerbation? Okay, so problem one, they're having an asthma exacerbation, you have to treat it, but then you also at some point you wanna step up their care so that they're not having the exacerbation to start with. So how do you treat an asthma exacerbation? Outpatient and emergency room treatment is going to include albuterol, leave albuterol, so the short-acting um, bronchodilators, and then also steroids, calming down that inflammation. And then your physician, your allergist, or your pediatrician is probably going to adjust that maintenance medication. I know that I do a lot of oral immunotherapy in my practice, and I have really honed in on kids that I thought maybe they had mild intermittent asthma, but as I'm trying to make sure their inflammatory diseases, their allergic disorders are very well controlled, I'm actually realizing, you know what, a lot of these mild intermittent asthmatics, they were probably mild persistent, and I was just trying not to step up management. 
because you know no no kid no no parent wants to put their kid on more medication right but but more so than that no parent wants to have their child suffering and so i'm even more keenly aware now of what kiddos are really mild intermittent compared to mild persistent. And that's important because we don't even want one asthma exacerbation, right? Anytime a kiddo is having trouble breathing, that is scary for all parties. And there are ways that we can prevent that. And it's really just stepping up our management. Inpatient treatment, if outpatient management fails, of course, they're going to get admitted for more aggressive asthma management. And really we like to, to prevent that. Most asthma exacerbations, they can be prevented with adequate control of asthma. Um, and controlling asthma really should include, and this is from Jackie in practice 2017, this is beautiful. It's so much more than just pharmacologic management, which is that fourth bullet point, really. It's patient education. I think we've all seen that house episode where the woman goes in and she's like, this inhaler is just not working. And he goes, well, how are you using it? And she puffs it like perfume. I hope some people are laughing out there at the webinar, so I can't tell. But, you know, these inhalers are not necessarily intuitive. And so having that patient education, taking that time, that, that extra 30 seconds to two minutes that it takes to make sure that your patient knows how to use their medication is just so important. Monitoring of symptoms and lung function. And this is where I think our, our school personnel can just be so helpful to us that that school nurse is seeing compared to all the other kiddos, how, how that child is running around and getting out of breath and needing albuterol. Whereas sometimes parents might just think, you know, they're not seeing them running around with their peers. Like, I think it's amazing whenever I get to see my, my kiddos interact with other children, because it's just not something that we see a whole lot of. Um, when they're doing activities and stuff, yes, but just the, the basic every day and seeing sort of the nuances there. Um, another shout out to school nurses. Um, I love school nurses. And then controlling of triggering factors and comorbid conditions. Oh my gosh, I'm an allergist, so I know I'm biased, but I'm biased because the evidence shows that if we control allergic disorders like allergic rhinitis, we can improve their asthma. Um, plug for allergists out there. And then pharmacologic therapy, appropriate pharmacologic therapy. So where do asthma exacerbations happen? They happen everywhere, everywhere. Home, school, airplanes, church, playground, everywhere. So that means we have to be prepared everywhere. Do not be like me and drive across like Pontchartrain train to my mama's house without my child's albuterol because then what happens is um, my child needs albuterol now luckily my mom had albuterol but i didn't have a spacer so i was able to take a styrofoam cup cut out the bottom of it and put this the inhaler into the cup she breathed it in she stopped coughing it was like magic it wasn't magic it was the correct medication delivered in an appropriate-ish fashion, but if I had just been a little bit more prepared, then it would have been just a much better experience for everybody. So stages of childhood um, and asthma. As a pediatrician, and Linda mentioned, I'm board certified in internal medicine and in pediatrics and in allergy. As a pediatrician, so I, I did med peds and before I did allergy. And med peds is really, you learn both internal medicine and pediatrics. And one of the most important parts of that training, I would say, is focusing on that transition from the pediatric care model to the adult care model. So if you go to GOT Transition, um, you can learn a lot about a lot about this. And really what it is, is not expecting an 18-year-old who's never been taught anything about how to schedule a doctor's appointment, what spirometry is, how to look at the number of puffs left on their inhaler, not expecting them suddenly magically when they turn 18 to know how to do that, right? Um, it takes intervention, even mild, very easy intervention, just planning. It all comes back to planning, y'all. So as early as 12, younger than 12, you can set a goal with a toddler. I know that for a fact. You can set a goal with a toddler quote me on it. You want to start goal setting with kiddos. They need to be involved in their asthma management. Um, around age 12 to 14, 
have a policy guide, discuss and share the transition policies. Um, and this can be like at your doctor's office, this can be even at school. This is definitely something that a physician should be doing with kiddos who have asthma, who have allergies. And so take a look at GOT transition and start thinking about that now. Again, so many of you guys are school nurses. These are things that you can just at the beginning of the year asking, depending on their age, do they have their albuterol inhaler? And look, I would definitely encourage anybody who is expecting a child to be self-carrying their um, asthma medication to have some spot check, some sort of quality measure as we would fancy call it, some sort of quality measure to make sure that kids who are supposed to have their medicine have it. Because high schoolers, sometimes they're like mature 35 year olds and sometimes they're like five year olds. This is probably no surprise to anybody. This is an asthma management strategy plan, right? This is your action plan. If you're in the green column, you're doing well. If you're in the yellow column, mm, we might need some quick relief medicine. And then if you're at the red column, this is serious business. Every child with asthma should have an asthma action plan. Um, it, it should be at home. It should be at school. Um, more than just the parents should know about it. Every child with asthma should have an asthma action plan. Um, and ideally, it really should be completed through shared decision making in the office with the physician, parents, and child. So I know how this goes. How this goes is schools need the forms before school, before school starts. So then the physician's office gets inundated with all of these forms, um, and hopefully they get filled out. But really, in a perfect world, there needs to be a back to school visit. This is what I stress in my practice. I love having a back to school visit because I want to go through all this with my patient. I mean, especially for asthma, this is your assessment and plan. How well are they doing? And then what is their plan? And depending on the age of the kiddo, they need to know all this. And so really when it's around the, the 10, 12 year olds, I am having a, a much more of a conversation with the kiddos than I'm having with the parents. Now, I expect the parents to be there listening and not on their phones. And that is usually how things go is that the parents are engaged too. But this is arguably the most important thing that a physician can do with, with their patient. <clears throat> and, you know, we've done studies with Codana um, and looked at how many kids who have asthma, reported asthma at school, have an asthma action plan. And it is a fraction of the kids. And so does that mean that the school doesn't know, the school nurse doesn't know that when the kid is wheezing to give albuterol? No, the school nurse knows. But what that really is to me is a red flag that that child does not have a, an engaged care plan with his or her physician. And so that could also mean that their asthma is not optimized. And if their asthma is not optimized, then they're at risk of having an exacerbation. So that's why I say this is arguably the most important part of asthma management. Okay, preparedness measures needed for children at risk of anaphylaxis. Um, I believe we have a question here. Courtney, can you put that question up? Okay, how many definitions of anaphylaxis are currently defined by major academic allergy societies? Do, 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 do. One, two, three, or four definitions of anaphylaxis. I need you guys five more seconds to vote. Two, one. Okay, go ahead and close that, Miss Courtney, please, and pull up the answer. Da, da, da. Oh, wow, quite the spread. So, some 28% of you think there's one definition, 20% think two, 32% think three, and 21% four. Very nice. The threes are correct. Here are three definitions of anaphylaxis. Um, now, I will also say that back when I was an allergy fellow at the University of Virginia, Wahoo Wah, um, Dr. Larry Borish, who is an asthma expert powerhouse, amazing, amazing dude, um, he would explain anaphylaxis um, as having a system-wide reaction to a local action, which I think is pretty brilliant, simple country people like me. You get stung here and you're not just having like just a local reaction, you're having a system-wide reaction. So you're stung by something and you start having hives and swelling, vomiting, dropping blood pressure. All those things are happening somewhere other than where it happened. 
So I think that's a pretty good um, rule of thumb. But let's look at these three different criteria. Special thanks to Code Anna, especially Sarah Jane Lowry for making this beautiful graphic here, which as you probably know, is based on a graphic um, that came out of a Jackie article. Um, but anaphylaxis, it's likely when one of the three following three criteria are fulfilled. So number one, you can have sudden onset illness of skin, lungs, or both, but skin has to be involved. So in this first definition of anaphylaxis, skin symptoms have to be involved. And please note that skin symptoms include swollen lips and tongue. So that's all technically one system. But in the first definition, you have to have some sort of skin manifestation in addition to coughing, wheezing, drop in blood pressure. Definition number two is sort of our more like classic example of two systems. So you can have hives and coughing, or you can have coughing and vomiting, or you can have vomiting and sudden drop in blood pressure. Any, any combination of those two systems, of two systems. The third definition is a drop in blood pressure after exposure to a known allergen. And that we're more so going to see in an ICU setting or in a venom allergy where just that very quick, brief exposure is causing a dramatic um, vascular collapse. And all of these happen within minutes, sometimes to hours of exposure. So out there, I know there's some alpha-gal people out there. Alpha-gal syndrome um, is when you're allergic to um, galactose, alpha-1,3 galactose, and that is a delayed onset anaphylaxis, meaning you might eat a cheeseburger and it's not three, four, five, six hours later until you're having hives and vomiting. But still, it's still hives and vomiting. So you still meet, you still have these criteria here, except that alpha-gal is going to be delayed for every other anaphylactic condition that we know of to date. It is happening within minutes to hours. So how common is anaphylaxis? It's too common. <laughs> In the health nut study, 5% of kiddos had food allergy at age six. Um, and then 44.6% reported an adverse reaction to a food in the last 12 months. So half of those food allergic kiddos. Um, and then in 30.7% of food allergic children, they had more than one reaction. Y'all, so 5% of kids, and, and y'all know the numbers kind of range. Is it 5%, is it 8%, is it 10%? Depends on the study, right? And how the study was done. Um, but just like with asthma, where okay, as, asthma is common, but asthma exacerbations don't have to be common, but they are common. It's the same with anaphylaxis. Food allergy is common and the reactions are common and, and we have to make them less common. And there are ways we can make them less common. And part of that really has to do with planning. And that's exactly why you guys are here to learn how to prevent and manage these types of reactions. Um, and 28, Children reported 29 reactions that met criteria, study criteria for anaphylaxis within the 12 months. So ultimately, as I alluded to, the true incidence of anaphylaxis, well, I didn't allude to that, but the true incidence of anaphylaxis is difficult to measure for many reasons, but I think we can all say that it's far too common. Let's talk about anaphylaxis in littles. Um, what this, um, graph is showing. Over here, we have weighted EV visits for per 1,000 visits. Um, here we have the calendar year. The bold line is ED visits, and the dotted line is hospitalization. So even though ED visits have increased for anaphylaxis, actual hospitalizations, thank goodness, have increased. Now, we can talk a lot about why that might be. Um, I like to think that it is because we're recognizing anaphylaxis more promptly, but also that people are more prepared to properly treat anaphylaxis with epinephrine. You know, it used to be, okay, if you're having anaphylaxis, let's give Benadryl and wait and see if it gets better. And we know based on data that prompt recognition of anaphylaxis 
and promptly utilizing epinephrine is what is going to result in a better outcome. We know that delayed recognition of anaphylaxis and delayed administration of epinephrine is what can result in a poor outcome. We also know that epinephrine, when administered from an auto injector, is incredibly safe. It is the right concentration of epinephrine, it is the right dose of epinephrine, so it's the right volume going in, and it's from an auto injector. So you're only going to be able to give that intramuscularly. You're not trying to give something IV or anything like that. And so these auto injectors are incredibly safe. And if it, if it wasn't a shock, then I know people would be significantly less hesitant to administer it. But epinephrine, we make epinephrine. Our adrenal glands are making epinephrine right now. So epinephrine, I'm going to get off my soapbox in just a moment, but epinephrine is the treatment for anaphylaxis and we cannot be nervous about giving it. So what is nice about this slide is that although hospital, um, although ED visits have increased, um, the hospitalization rate has decreased. That's good. So how do you really treat anaphylaxis? This is super important. This is an example of how anaphylaxis should be treated at school. You first have to recognize that anaphylaxis is occurring and you want to activate the emergency alert system, typically 911, getting your MediReady team. If you don't know what MediReady is, go to codiana.org and learn all about it. You want to have that person who's having the reaction lay down. You want them to be laying down in a safe place, of course, but laying down, that's going to ultimately help the medication circulate. Um, then you're going to administer epinephrine. Epinephrine administration if you're on this call, then chances are you know how to use an epinephrine auto injector. And then because you're in a school setting, you are transporting them to the emergency room via EMS. There has been a lot of discussion amongst allergists, especially after COVID, about having a family go, having to have to go to the emergency room after one dose of epi. That is a decision that needs to be made between a family and their allergist. I can tell you that in my practice, a lot of the families. Um, we feel very comfortable saying, you know, if it's with the parents, there's an accidental ingestion, they use epi and their prompt, the child is promptly improving, does not need a second dose of epi, airway is not involved, then active observation at home, that's fine. But that is a medical decision that is being made between the family and the doctor. Um, so that should all be well decided before a reaction occurs. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute about anaphylaxis action plans. But how do you actually prevent anaphylaxis? The avoidance, as we all know, is the only way to actually prevent anaphylaxis. Yes, you can do immunotherapy to help grow tolerance, to ultimately help a child not have an act, not have an allergic reaction if they do have an ingestion of their allergen. But really, the only way to prevent anaphylaxis in somebody who has an allergy is to avoid the allergen. Um, so there are ways, I've just talked about this, how to induce tolerance, but I will not go into that. So just like asthma exacerbations can happen anywhere, especially at grandmother's house, like that happens with my little kiddo, um, where does anaphylaxis occur? This was from the Health Nut study, and it showed that a lot of episodes of anaphylaxis are occurring at home, or this is where it gets scarier for families. What if it's at a friend's house? Um, what if it's at a restaurant or at school or somewhere else? But really the friend's houses are the ones that I hear um, a lot of concern from my patients. And again, just like we talked about the transition, um, transitioning kiddos from the pediatric care model to the adult care model, I cannot um, underscore enough the importance of this transition and starting when they're young, get them used to setting goals uh, for their health and start having that conversation of self-carrying their device. Self-carry does not equal self-administer. And sometimes schools conflate these things. A child can absolutely self-carry even if they are not prepared or, or developmentally ready to self-administer the medication. And that has to be differentiated. You have to be very clear about, is this child capable of self-carrying, yes or no, and counsel them on the importance of, this is not a toy, you carry this medication, you're responsible for this medication. And I mean, when, when, you're with, when they're with mom, dad, do mom and dad always have backups? Yes. Um, at school, should all schools have stock epinephrine? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, but at some point, the child has to start self-managing. In this case, it's it's small baby step goals. We don't want them to turn 18 and suddenly know, oh wait, I've got to carry this. Oh wait, I don't I don't know how to call and get a refill. I don't know how to call my doctor's office. So start, start young. And here are some examples of the anaphylaxis action plans. Um, one is from FAIR, one is from AAP. And really, just like with asthma, every child who has a diagnosis of an anaphylactic food allergy should have an anaphylaxis action plan. If the child has a venom allergy, honeybee or fire ant, they should also have an anaphylaxis action plan. Um, and again, this should be completed through shared decision-making in the office with the doctor, have that back to school appointment. That's so important. I know um, one of our one of our um, patient moms, she always schedule the, schedules the allergist appointment at the end of July um, so that she can get all the forms completed because they also have to be within a certain date. She can make sure she has the medications that they need. And also just like with asthma, there are new treatments coming out so often. You, Kiddos who have asthma or allergy, they need to at least be having an appointment at least every year to discuss the different therapies and make sure that their condition as a whole is very well controlled. Um, you know, I can, I can sit in my office and talk to my patients about the newest, greatest thing for food allergy management, but if that family is, is too nervous to even go out to eat together or too nervous to um, share a meal with their family, because of because of food allergies, then those are issues that that we have to address. I would not say that their food allergy is well controlled, even though if if they're avoiding and they're doing a good if not they're doing a good job of you can do the best job of avoiding and sometimes accidental ingestions they just happen. But my point is, food allergy and asthma management is so much more than just the medical management. And it's very important that we serve families and identify other comorbid issues that go along with these disorders and help families manage those. It's a little bit outside the scope of today's discussion. So I'll reel back in here. All kiddos who have an anaphylactic food allergy need an anaphylaxis action plan. Not in this talk though, and what I should have put in this talk, is it really any kiddo with any food allergy should have an emergency care plan. So if you have a kiddo who has f -pies, well, for f -pies, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, that is not an anaphylactic food allergy, but it can be incredibly severe. What that looks like is when a kiddo eats a food, it seems like they tolerate it, and then three-ish hours later, projectile, scary, scary vomiting. They can also have diarrhea. They can get very sloppy. They look very, very sick. They need to be rehydrated. Um, that is not IgE mediated. So epinephrine is not the treatment. Really rehydration, supportive measures, Zofran can, can help um, with the nausea vomiting. But any kid really who has any sort of medical condition that can go acute, as I say, needs an emergency care plan. So how do you develop that emergency plan? <laughs> well, let's talk about that. Um, a child-specific needs assessment. So again, the diagnosis annually at least visits with a specialist to confirm or revisit the diagnoses. I mean, how many kids have I seen? I can't tell you. When I was at um, Vanderbilt, just I really had like the rule out food allergy clinic where so many kids, not, not the Vanderbilt allergists, but so many kids had been um, had been told like, oh, we're allergic to peanuts. And then you should just avoid all tree nuts. This was not the Vanderbilt allergist telling them this. Um, and they've been avoiding all these foods and it might sound easy, like, oh, we'll just avoid it. But if, if you're telling a family you need to avoid these foods, because if your child eats them, then it could kill them. Um, that's a big deal. And we as doctors need to recognize that that's a big deal and not put that diagnosis on somebody who does not genuinely have that diagnosis. And so it is very important to revisit these diagnoses at least annually because some kids do outgrow their food allergies or they do resolve, right? Um, asthma improves or is asthma getting worse and the family just doesn't really realize it. I was work, working with a family recently who 
the asthma has gotten a lot better. And so they're so happy about it, but the poor little guy is still having lots of sim sim symptoms. And so even though they're seeing it as like so much better, his, his care providers are seeing it as like, no, 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 wait, we get it even better and we need to do that. That's our job. But if we're not seeing the patients, then we don't know what's going on. So having those visits, having those follow-ups is so important. The emergency management, having the updated emergency care plans and not just doing, okay, well, this is what he was allergic to last year, or this was the asthma medicine last year, having that shared decision-making, so important. And then preventive strategies, discuss the therapies to prevent those acute manifestations. How are we going to prevent reactions from happening? How are we going to prevent asthma exacerbations from happening? Um, Child-specific needs-informed care plans continued. Okay, so emergency action plan, y'all, for school, for babysitters, for others. And this is right here, anaphylaxis action plan, asthma action plan, action plan for any other medical issues. Do not ever assume, and school nurses, y'all know, we don't ever want families thinking, oh, well, they'll just do who even knows what, right? Like, I, in a perfect world, the doctor has laid out specifically what the child's diagnosis is and what the emergency treatment plan should be. And then well ahead of time, if there's a discrepancy, if you think, if you as a school nurse think, well, I don't, this, this doesn't seem consistent with what Dr. Witt was talking about on that allergy and asthma network discussion, because she said that we don't wanna give Benadryl and wait and see what's going on here. Knowing that ahead of time and being able to sort that out ahead of time is just so much better than in the moment trying to figure out what's the right thing for that child. So school plan, do you need a 504 plan? Do you need an individualized healthcare plan? Do you need an IEP? I am not gonna go into significant detail about these, but I will say that in most cases, having a 504 plan is incredibly helpful. Having an, an individualized healthcare plan, that is gonna be different than having a 504 plan. That gets more in the weeds about specific healthcare stuff. Um, and an IEP is more if educational needs are affected by it, but um, Allergy and Asthma Network has some really, really great resources on these. So definitely check those out. Extracurricular plans parent-to-parent -parent letters. So these are some of the things that I have found in my practice that we as doctors haven't really been helpful for our patients in telling them how to manage this stuff. So I've actually created some of these resources where it's a parent-to-parent -parent letter. It's the template for how you can tell parents or how on your group me you can send out to every, the parents in the class of like, my child so-and-so has this allergy. Thank you so much in advance for trying not to bring any treats that contain this. If you do, please just let me know so that I can make other accommodations, things like that. Um, and then activity specific plans, soccer, all these other things. You want any adult who is responsible for your child to know how to manage if there is an emergency. And it all comes back to planning. It all comes back to having that up to date plan. So what school plan? Do you need an action plan? Yes. Every kid who has any sort of medical condition needs an emergency action plan, a 504 plan. Um, you may need one if you think your child's food allergy limits their ability to participate fully in school activities and requires special accommodations. Um, I think this can be very helpful to, to obtain these, an IHP. It's more than an action plan. It really helps your stu the student stay well at school. And then an IEP is more if it's if an educational disability is present. Um, so that's a very quick overview of these. And then what other plans? So this is an example of a social sharing plan. Um, very gently says, this is my kiddo, this is what they're allergic to. And these are some of my favorite foods and my favorite alternatives. Because many kiddos, they do participate in some form of extracurricular activity for their supervised by adults that are not their teachers. Their school nurse is not there after school. Um, it's important that there are both preventive strategies and emergency management strategies known to all adults responsible for the child. And as kiddos get older, it's really important for their friends to know too. And what I have seen is that this really becomes a beautiful um, way that kids are being empowered to be leaders and to show kindness and love on their friends by advocating for their friends. Um, and then plans for people outside of the school setting. Um, and this is that, that social sharing plan that I mentioned. Here's an 
example of a child-specific needs assessment, I am all about tables. I love tables and I love lists. So here we have this table that I made where I have a child's diagnosis, their emergency plan, their emergency medications, and then what preventive and management strategies should we have in place for this kiddo? So this kiddo who has asthma absolutely needs an asthma action plan as their emergency plan. Emergency medications are include albuterol, spacer, and steroids. Now the steroids might not be something they're doing at school, but would be something where mom at home is noticing, oh, asthma exacerbation is occurring. Let me have this, these steroids on hand and maybe that can calm it down. I'll let the pediatrician or the allergist or pulmonologist know that I'm giving them, but maybe this can calm it down before it turns into a full-blown exacerbation. And then what are the preventative and management strategies? The IHP, the maintenance medication, the social sharing, the extracurricular plan. And so you can see similar stuff for peanut allergy, anaphylaxis action plan, auto injectors, and then preventive and management strategies. Global strategies, okay. So all schools should be prepared for medical emergencies. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Medical emergencies are more common than fire emergencies. We have fire drills. We do not regularly have medical emergency response protocols. That is where Codana comes in and helps schools have medical emergency response plans, have teams, and stock medications. There's no reason all schools shouldn't have stock epinephrine, stock albuterol, stock naloxone. Um, if you want to learn more about that, Cody and it's Medi ready. So I am not over time. Woot woot. Um, and now you know how to describe and list the preparedness measures needed for kiddos with asthma, those who are at risk of anaphylaxis, and you have all the tools you need to develop your emergency plan, to have that emergency plan, also know the preventive measures and, and what your kiddo needs and what kiddos in your care need. Thank you. You can follow me on social. Next webinar. That's going to be a good one. Okay, Miss Linda. <laughs> Thank do we you, have Dr. questions? Boyd. We do. We've got eight or 10. Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Um, first one is I give epi when a student has eaten a known allergen, has asthma, and states their airways feel tight. I sense other medical providers aren't as quick to administer. I'm wondering if I'm being a little bit too proactive. I don't think you can be proactive, too proactive when it comes to epi. Epi, um, administering epi will not have any long-term adverse effects. It will cause pain at the injection site and an increase in heart rate, whether a kiddo needs it or not why we don't want to wait and see if other symptoms start to occur is because then we're behind the eight ball. We want to promptly recognize and promptly administer. And honestly, if, if, if you administer and then you're told, oh, well, they, they didn't really need it. Well, what you actually did was a great job because you cut that anaphylaxis off before it could develop into a life-threatening reaction. Great. Um, can you comment on the use of Benadryl at the same time as using epinephrine? Sure. So Benadryl itself um, is not a great drug. It's an old drug. It crosses the blood brain barrier. It can cause altered mental status, whether that is grogginess or the opposite, meaning kids get really hyper. But regardless, you really don't want to be administering anything with anaphylaxis that is going to cause altered mental status. So that's one reason not to do it. The second reason not to do it is really because you don't want somebody thinking, oh, well, I need to give the Benadryl first and let me just wait and see if if I really still need to give the epi. On top of that, epinephrine is the medication that is gonna shut down those mast cells, those allergy cells that are secreting the histamine. And so you can give the Benadryl um, or any antihistamine and, and see if, if that can help stop that, some of those itchy symptoms after it, it comes out, or you can just give the epi, which is gonna stop it from coming out. And it's also going to help with the itchy and with the swelling. So, is it wrong? Is, is it wrong to give Benadryl? I tell my patients, throw the Benadryl away. I don't want you ever giving any more Benadryl. Give Zyrtec, give Allegra. Just don't give Benadryl. But the root of the question, I think, is, is it wrong to give an antihistamine at the same time as giving epi? It is not wrong to do it at the same time, but epinephrine is the first line treatment for anaphylaxis. 
Good. Um, we have two questions about exercise induced bronchospasm. Um, mm -hmm. First one is, is it normal for a student to use their inhaler before going to PE or before going outside for recess if they're having no symptoms? We have two students whose parents want them to be using it before PE or recess. Yes, so that is normal. So that's an exercise induced asthma. And that is a perfectly probably the only perfectly appropriate time that someone can use their albuterol before they go out and do exercise. So that's perfectly fine. If you, however, feel like, you know what, they're still getting winded or I have a concern about this, then that's absolutely a great time to have um, a bilateral relief between you and the doctor so that y'all can talk through together um, what the proper indication of that is. And of course, have the parent looped in. We always do total transparency, shared decision-making. Um, but I love that that's the question and that you're, you're so mindful of that. But yeah, that is, that is a strategy that we do incorporate. And related to that is if a student is um, using their inhaler before exercise every day, is their asthma considered controlled? That's a good question. If they're using it because their doctor has told them, well, you have exercise induced asthma and you really only need it before you exercise, there are literally no other times that you need it. it. It's perfectly fine. We will still say that that's well controlled. I will say though, when you, when you sort of dive deeper into those cases, sometimes you can find that they are having some, well, sometimes I have some symptoms at night. Well, sometimes this. And really, if you do trial a controller medication and they're not needing it before exercise, then actually sometimes their stamina can improve. So that is certainly a strategy that we use and it's not a wrong strategy, um, but there are, other, there are other strategies to also consider. I'm kind of hedging on that because it's, it's really very patient dependent. Okay. I have a question for you that hasn't yeah. been submitted. Okay. Can you talk about whether you're not sure if it's an asthma attack or if it's anaphylaxis and should you use epinephrine? Yes. So if you're not sure if someone's having an asthma attack or anaphylaxis, it is absolutely, yes, you can and is encouraged to use epinephrine because it is our kiddos who have asthma and food allergy that are at risk of fatal reactions, as you mentioned in the beginning of the call, Linda. And we do not want to mess around waiting for more of those allergy cells to secrete more of those bronchoconstrictors, vasodilators, to make the reaction more severe. We wanna go ahead and cut it off at the pass. Now, if it's an asthma exacerbation, epinephrine is actually one of the therapies, it's not the first line therapy, but it is one of the therapies that we use sometimes to treat asthma exacerbations in the hospital setting. Giving epinephrine is not going to hurt them. In that case, you could absolutely give epi and give albuterol at the same time. And none of that is going to, when I say hurt them, it's not going to cause any long-term effects. You want to be as proactive as you can, especially in our asthmatics who have food allergy, because those are the ones who are at risk of fatal anaphylaxis. That's an awesome question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and 30 years ago, before there were auto injectors, I would take my son to the emergency room as a baby, they'd give him two shots of epinephrine and a dose of solumedrol. So it for, used to be, for asthma. Yeah, for his asthma. Yeah. 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 So, um, okay, next question. Um, the problem with self administering epi in teens is that it puts the responsibility mm -hmm. on recognizing symptoms and the response to a child. Do you gauge, how do you gauge readiness for teenagers? It's a really good question. Um, things that I, in any teenager, I, I think, I think in general, we really, um, I don't want to say we infantilize our teenagers. I think teens are incredibly bright. They're incredibly bright. They're incredibly capable. Incredibly, like if you look back in biblical times, so many of the people doing amazing things were teenagers. Um, so I think that very objective things you look for when you're trying to decide is, is a teenager ready to, to self-manage. It has to be a baby steps approach, like I talked about. Let's start with small goals. Okay, you have a life-threatening allergy. You have an anaphylactic food allergy. You need to carry your medication and start with that and then build up. Don't expect them to suddenly be able to do all these things at once because for years, it has been mom, dad, grandmother, somebody other than themselves who has been solely responsible for doing all of this stuff. So it will be completely overwhelming and they will rebel if you suddenly just say, okay, will you manage it? And I just say, that's, that's not good. That's not good for anybody, right? 
So start with baby steps. Say, okay, you're going to start carrying your epinephrine auto injector. And you can absolutely put a reward system. There's nothing wrong with having a reward system in place. Um, I'm definitely more of a carrot than stick person, but sometimes you need a, a stick, not a real stick, a philosophical stick. Um, so you can have consequences, right? But you really want to start with with reward systems, having them, okay, you're carrying your epi, great job. You've been carrying your epi for a week. We've spot checked you for a week. Um, now you've earned, I don't know, pizza or something with your friends, things like that. Um, but really don't expect them to do it immediately, but start the conversation. Absolutely, the physician needs to be involved and they will start to take the baton. It really is like the, uh, the relay where you're running and then they start running with you and you run together for a while before they start going. And so that's how this should start um, and start with just very, very small questions like, okay, are you ready to self-carry? Cause you're 12 years old now and it's, it's time. Now where we, where we don't do this is in kiddos who do have developmental delay. Um, we're not talking about those kiddos. We're talking about kiddos who, um, who are in regular education classes, honors class, those sorts of things. So, but but that's really how I like to do it. Great. Um, regarding the the chart you showed about the signs of anaphylaxis, um, one of the questions we got was, "I'm confused. If they only have respiratory symptoms, do we not treat with epi?" Dun, dun, dun. I love that question. Um, so this is the this these are the criteria for diagnosis of anaphylaxis. What you're getting to is the boorish criteria of where you have a, right, you eat a food and then suddenly you start having respiratory symptoms. That comes into the anaphylaxis action plan and what has the, what is the recommendation from the provider? I a million percent recommend my patients who have known food allergies, they eat something and they start having any sort of airway symptom if they vomit once, if they have more than five hives, um, that they use epi. And I think I've driven home the point of why it's because the epi is going to stop the reaction. So you absolutely are not wrong in thinking, well, if they're having respiratory issues, shouldn't I give epi? Yes, you should. And if you're in a, a situation where it's stock epi, um, then, and you know, for stock epi, you have to meet these criteria to use it or whatever. You have to be having anaphylaxis. A kid who is in respiratory distress is not going to be feeling well. And so there you go. There's altered mental status. There's your second system. Okay. Can you briefly discuss the potential adverse effects associated with overuse of albuterol inhalers? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, in an acute setting, if a kiddo is having respiratory distress, you know, it says, you know, give two puffs and, and whatever, and give two more puffs a little bit later, whatever the, the emergency plan says. In the short term, until they get to the emergency room, you just want to get their airways open. Long term, which is what I think the question is, long term or using it a whole lot, you can have increases in heart rate. That's never ideally really good. Um, but really what that's also saying is that you have significant airway inflammation and you're at risk of having a more severe episode. Um, so that's really why we don't want somebody use, 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 using their albuterol so much. It's because like, yeah, it's going to open your airways, but it is going to increase your heart rate, which is fine in, in the moment. Um, but it's really demonstrating the larger problem that asthma, which yes, children still die from asthma, that their asthma is not well controlled. And so it needs to get better controlled. Uh, should we be giving in the inhaler if a child is complaining of shortness of breath, but no wheezing or rouse heard with auscultation? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it won't hurt to give the albuterol. Um, and in fact, sometimes a kid's asthma can be so bad that you don't hear really much of anything because there's such poor air movement. But unless you're like really keenly aware, you're doing lung exams all the time, you might not really like realize that, but some of the worst asthma exacerbations I've heard of taking care of kids in the pediatric ICU, like at first you're listening, you're like, I don't hear any wheezing. And you're like, wait, and you listen to yourself, you listen to them, you listen to yourself, you're like, I don't hear anything. And that's because their airways are so tightened up. And so if they're coughing, there's definitely cough variant asthma, 
So you want to try that albuterol and see if that helps them. It won't hurt them. Got it. So I'll do one more question. It's five o'clock and then I'll wrap up real quick. So what's your initial workup after a child or adult has presented for the first time with anaphylaxis? That's okay. So the most important thing to do is have a conversation with the person. I was doing a consultation today and here I am, like, I hate typing and doing stuff while I'm having a, a conversation. Now, granted, if I don't write something down, then that's bad. Um, but it just got to a point where I was like, I just have to put my computer down. I'm just going to sit and have a conversation with you, which is what I really prefer to do and do most of the time. Um, having that eye to eye conversation with the person who experienced the reaction, if it's a kiddo who is even like four or five, six years old, you are directing some questions specifically to them. Um, but just having a conversation, trying to tease out exactly what happened, what food did they eat or foods, how were the foods prepared? What is the timeline? What exactly, what symptoms happened and how long after eating until those symptoms happened? I can tell you like when alpha gal, I mentioned earlier, the mammalian meat allergy, people would eat sausage for breakfast, but then they're having salad at lunch and they think they're reacting to the salad. They're actually having a reaction to the sausage they ate at breakfast, right? Um, or interesting, um, having tacos, I think they're reacting to the cheese while they're acting to the soy that's in the pork taco meat, which was the strangest thing, but it legit happens. So you want to be an excellent, excellent historian and be very detailed because 95% of the time you can get the diagnosis without any sort of testing. Wow. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Hoyt. You were fabulous. Um, it's been so informative. I can already see the thank yous coming in. And so you've really helped a lot of people by being here and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, so I just want to let everybody know, we look for that follow-up email. We'll be giving you lots of links. And we, we really should include information about Code Anna and some of the efforts that you're involved in. So I'll follow up with um, our in-house staff about getting that done. We have two webinars coming up in December for everybody to know about. One um, is on December 14th, that's for COVID, RSV, and flu, how to stay healthy. And um, in January, we'll be having another webinar about not everything that coughs is asthma. Um, so look for that email in the next few days. Thank you sincerely from all of us at Allergy and Asthma Network, where together we work so that everyone can breathe better together. Good night, everybody.